Justin's so creative. <laughs> those two, oh, those yeah. two combined are just hilarious. So good. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Awesome. Everybody, welcome Liz Rice and Duffy Cooley from Isovalent. I said that right, I think. Uh, yep. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> they are joining us to talk about not just uh, EKS Anywhere, but Cilium and eBPF on EKS Anywhere and what you can do with it. And, you know, I'm, I'm super excited for this talk because CNIs are, you know, there's a lot of them out there nowadays. And, you know, Cilium is a very good one, but then the EP, eBPF pieces on top of it are even better. So I'm super excited for this uh, presentation we have coming up next. So round of introductions. Liz, you want to introduce yourself first and shout out to our interpreter, Arthur. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Hi, Arthur, as well. And hi, everyone who's watching. Yeah, my name is Liz Rice. I am Chief Open Source Officer at Isovalent, and we are doing all sorts of really exciting things with the eBPF, uh, particularly in the Cilium project. We've got some pretty cool things to talk about next week at KubeCon as well. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, we're all in the kind of final phases of getting ready for next week, and uh, that's going to be exciting. <laughs> Yeah, no, right. Duffy and Liz are going to both be at uh, KubeCon, I believe, right? Correct. Awesome. Yeah, so I'll get to see you all there. Duffy, sorry, yeah, cut you I'm, off there. No, no problem. I'm Duffy Cooley. I'm the field CTO at Isovalent. And like Liz, I'm I'm super, and, and yourself, Chris, I'll be, I'll be there at KubeCon all week next week. And I'm super excited about it. We have a couple of uh, things to talk about in this session about, you know, how you can kind of come find out more about EBPF, more about Cilium, more about all of those things. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to next week. It's super exciting. Yeah, Spain. Can't wait. It's been very cold here in Michigan this year. Uh <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely ready. Re definitely ready for a, for a, for a tropical day. Like it's maybe not tropical, but it's not quite tropical. But Mediterranean, I'll take Warm. it. You know? yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand that you know, a lot of people where Liz is actually go to Spain for for just exactly that type of thing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Here in Europe, Spain is you know somewhere that you go for the warm. I guess like folks in the US maybe go to the. What I would call Caribbean, I think you would say Caribbean. Yeah. <laughs> I guess Spain no, is no the Mediterranean is, is to us what the Caribbean is for you. Yeah, pretty <laughs> much. Sounds like it. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. So, what's awesome. up at Isovalent? Getting started here. I think um, first I'd like to say a little bit about the EKS Anywhere and the Cilium piece. I mean, mm -hmm. it's been really great, like actually seeing uh, a lot of adoption. I mean, we've we've had a, we've had a, a good number of uh, conversations with folks who are really kind of stepping up with EKS Anywhere and engaging with it. Um, I've also had some really great conversations with folks at AWS, uh, solutions architects and partner solutions architects that are actually working with people, like really kind of getting folks ramped up on those sorts of things. And that's been awesome. So it's really kind of great to see like better connectivity tissue between like isovalent as a company and like how people are actually le leveraging Cilium in, in their products today. Um, and I think that that's actually at least partially due to a lot of the stuff that we've already seen today. I mean, like some of the, some of the, um, some of the projects that are, are out, you know, that you all have talked about, like being able to actually, you know, have like an application marketplace and like, you know, kind of developing that whole space is, is I think going to be really helpful to, to kind of drive adoption of EKS anywhere. So mm -hmm. it's, it seems like it's really taken off. Um, and the next thing I wanted to talk about was that we actually have a blog up on Cilium. Uh, Cilium.io that actually has a whole list of talks um, around like uh, Cilium talks. Share your screen if you Cilium, want. And Cilium events and stuff. And so I could actually, I guess I could share my screen or I could just talk through it here. What would you prefer? Yeah, your choice. Your choice. Okay. I think bring it up because then we can all see where we are. Yeah. There we go. Oh, size doing it. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go over to cilium.io in our blogs, I mean, there's a ton of really great blog content on there, but this particular set of talks is going to mean, this is going to be kind of an intro into what is happening with isovalent and Cilium next week. Um, we have a ton of stuff happening, and uh, this is just a great way of kind of learning more about Cilium. 
and that is the base CNI for EKS Anywhere. So if you're if you're interested in like Cilium and how eBPF works and all of that stuff, I really highly recommend come check it, come in and check us out. We're going to be at two locations on the show floor. We're going to be oh. over by the CNCF booth, and we're going to have a Cilium uh, project booth because Cilium is an OSS is a project that has been donated to CNCF. So if you want to learn more about Cilium specifically, definitely come check that booth out. We can talk. We can walk you through like what's what's happening with the project and kind of give you a good overview of what Cilium as an OSS project is and what it's actually doing for you underneath your EKS Anywhere cluster. And I think that um, on that note, it's also worth mentioning the talk that's kind of in the middle of that list there, the, the Cilium Welcome Vision and Updates. This is going to be the first time we get to, as the Cilium project, you know, now it's part of the CNCF, we get to run maintainer session at KubeCon in person. So it's going to be a really great um, opportunity for people who are interested in the project to come and meet other maintainers, um, hear more about, you know, what we're planning on working on for the for the next few months and, and folks who do want to get involved with the sort of development side, we would love to meet you. Um, and not just development, any kind of contribution. Right. Um, I'm super excited about the fact that, you know, we, we get to kind of meet the community who are working on this project that would be really fun i mean i'm excited just to see what what's to come right like that's my big thing there's so much opportunity here right there's i mean the ebpf day on monday i i i joined isovalent because i'm so uh, interested in the the scope of the things that we can do with ebpf as a technology mm -hmm. um for folks who are maybe watching and aren't familiar with eBPF, what it lets us do is program the kernel. We can dynamically change the way the kernel behaves. And that uh, allows for networking capabilities. Cilium is, is pretty well known as a networking project. Um, but it also allows us to inspect what's happening across an entire node from the kernel's perspective. And we can use that for security purposes. We can get tons of really interesting observability information out of it. Um, so, you know, from Cilium's perspective, we're doing exciting things on Monday's eBPF day. We're going to be hearing about lots of other really cool innovations taking advantage of eBPF. And I think that's going to be a, a really great day. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that one too. I mean, one of the things that uh, that Liz and I got to actually participate, I think, in uh, last week was that we um, we are trying to extend eBPF Day to also include things that are kind of more hands-on and like kind of show you like people using eBPF and those sorts of things and like how it works. And so this is actually going to be a great opportunity for you if you're leveraging Cilium and your EKS cluster to kind of to to see how things might go if things are programmed differently or, or, or challengingly. We worked with um, David Flanagan, uh, Rock Code on Twitter and everywhere else, mm -hmm. um, to do a clustered version of eBPF, of, of eBPF Day. So we, you know, we had some attackers, which included Thomas Graf, our CPO, and we had our fixers, which are Liz and I and a few other folks. And <laughs> If you and we're going to be uh, presenting that, and there will also be a panel involved in that at the end of the day at EBPF Day. And then well, there's one other thing I wanted to point out that I think maybe isn't widely known, but if you have a virtual ticket to KubeCon, then you actually uh, can participate in any of the co-located events for free. Right? Oh, that's good. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Wow. Okay, cool. So if you don't, if you have an in-person event, I mean, if you're there in person, you do have to register to mm -hmm. be able to get into the room where that is happening. But if you're virtual, then just jump right in. And we're going to have a, a Slack channel on the CNCF Slack that is uh, isovalent. No, wait, it's going to be, what is it? It's kubecon Cilium. That's what it is. Okay. So yeah, feel free to jump in there and ask questions. Um, but yeah, all of these talks will be available to you and effectively simulcast. And of course, like after the show, you're going to be able to see all the recordings of everything. But there's a lot of really great stuff that we're going to be talking about. And the other thing I love about eBPF Day is that it's not just Cilium. It's, you know, eBPF Day, right? So it's like literally talking, just like um, Liz pointed out, it's talking about all kinds of different interesting projects um, that are leveraging BPF today. Yeah, I'm going to drop your uh, Slack channel link in chat here. The yeah, the 
like Liz, I first met you at like GopherCon 2017 and you did a talk about like, you did something with Go and it just blew my mind. It was all about system calls and it totally yeah. blew my mind. And like eBPF is totally like that extension on top of um, the kernel that just lets you do things and secure and almost like native fashion to secure your cluster. It's really nice. Um, yeah, it's it's that kind of ability to um, influence or measure or instrument applications without any change to the applications at all. Yeah, you, know, mm -hmm. yeah, you don't, don't have to, have to be reconfigured. They don't have to be restarted. You know, with eBPF, yeah. we can inspect processes that are already running, which is a real sea change in the in the way that we instrument mm -hmm. projects, and particularly in cloud native. You know, and um, one of the interesting things we'll be talking about next week is Cilium Service Mesh, and. Uh, much like uh, any kind of observability or security tooling, Service Mesh typically, until now, has used sidecars yeah. to inject containers into the application, which is pretty transparent. You don't have to change the application, but you do have to change the, the YAML, the pod configuration. Right. And with Cilium Service Mesh, we don't have to do that. We can, we're basically pulling the Service Mesh capabilities onto the node, the pod is completely unaware, doesn't need to know, but you can get the kind of instrumentation, the observability, the networking capabilities that we that we need from a service mesh and in a much, much more efficient fashion. And it's much easier, it's many fewer moving parts than you would have in the sidecar model. So um, I've got to talk about that. Thomas is gonna be on a panel at um, service mesh Con service mesh day, day. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm expecting there will be quite a lot of interest in that because we certainly had we, we had nearly 400 people who signed up to the Cilium wow. service mesh beta program and have been you know telling us how they've been getting on with that. Um, so hopefully we will hear even more from people how they've been getting on and what they need and uh, you know having some interesting discussions about that. That's awesome. Like yeah. a service mesh based on eBPF already like brings smiles to my faces because you don't really have to touch your pods. And if you are like a lot of enterprises out there, there's some stuff in your environment where you kind of like set it and forget it. And like you might have migrated an old application over to cube and you did that and it was a lot of work. And now you're trying to like, oh, how can I improve or see measure? You don't have to muck with it. You just lay this on top and off it goes. It can look at all the stats. It uses the Linux kernel under the hood and off. It, it, it pulls in everything you need without you having to reprogram anything. It's low. yeah, Yeah. 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 And we have some really great, um, you know, metrics. We've got um, Prometheus metrics measuring all sorts mm -hmm. of interesting points. So we can you know, show you Grafana dashboards with latency measurements and you know packet drops and errors and all kinds of um cool metrics that are essentially thought. out of the box for service mesh because we already have them in cilium for the network layer anyway it's it's exactly. pretty cool <laughs> so there i actually saw the other day there was a github repo i came across it was actually using ebpf to manage like power consumption so you could identify oh. which pod was taking the most energy like, that's crazy to me, <laughs> but it's awesome. It. <laughs> like, think about all the energy savings we could do if we just measured it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know. I, <laughs> one of my friends is is quite involved in in the Green Software Foundation, and uh, and, and she's been sort of saying, isn't there like an, e uh, like an angle here around eBPF um, for uh, just the, the – the reduction in the number of resources you need, does that mean that it's essentially a greener way of running software? And I don't want to kind of overstate that because no. to some extent, you know, as engineers, we will use the resources that we, you know, things will expand to fill the resources that we have. But there is some truth in it. You know, if you can do things more efficiently, it does make things more energy efficient. So, uh. yeah, yeah that's, yeah, what, yeah, go ahead. 
you say one of the pieces that I think that is super interesting from the service mesh perspective about what we're able to accomplish here that I think um, you know kind of highlights your point about like the the neat thing that we're bringing to it with EBPF is that like in the sidecar model we you know we're effectively like putting the application and the sidecar next to each other and we're attracting all of the traffic from that application to the sidecar and then forwarding that traffic to the um, to wherever the next destination is in the Cilium model and the Cilium service mesh model, we're changing that paradigm a little bit, right? We're basically leveraging EBPF at the kernel layer to basically take the traffic out of the socket from the application and transparently proxy it through that Envoy instance or that, that configured Envoy listener. And then, and then forwarding the traffic after it comes out of that proxy toward where it was headed next. Right. And this is like kind of leveraging the EPF to do the magic of how we're actually going about this. Right. Um, and then the other piece of it, like, you know, y'all have highlighted a few times is that like, you know, since EBPF is such a rich context, uh, such is so rich in context, right. That is really like one of the biggest pieces I see people using the EBPF for today. And you're going to see us talking about that at EBPF day. You're going to see us talking about that at service mesh con with uh, Thomas being on the, um, on the panel, um, and we're going to be talking about it at Security Day. There's just, you know, it's just amazing how much context we have. And now it's, yeah. you know, you know, our our exercise in service mesh has really been about not necessarily finding new ways to do things, but also just <laughs> figuring out how to present the amazing amount of context that we have in ways mm -hmm. that people expect that data to be presented from a service mesh. Right? We've had this data for a long time. Right, we've been you've been able to use Hubble Observe to see when there's a 200 or a 400 or a 50 or a 504 in an HTTP session between two endpoints in in a in a cluster for quite some time, but we haven't actually expressed that as a metric that could be measured, and now we have. Right, mm -hmm. it's like you know, it's like that level of instrumentation has been around for some for you know the whole time. It's just a matter of like figuring out like how people want to consume it and making sure right. they it that way. So how are you seeing people like use the, the either the service mess or, or just EBPF itself or, you know, any of the things that we've talked about so far? Like, what are the normal use cases that you're seeing or the most obvious ones, I guess? Yeah, I think that, you know, I think I think the biggest use case that I see like most frequently, hands down, is that like, you know, when people are leveraging this as a CNI, they get a level of visibility just out of the box that just mm -hmm. blows them away, right? Being able to actually... You know, like a lot of more secure environments now are doing things where they don't allow for like these things like TCP cap or um, uh, TCP dump and those sorts of things inside of containers, which is a good security move, right? That's a reasonable security posture to have. But what it means is that like a lot of folks who are coming from kind of a, an older development world where they're trying to understand like wire protocol, like what's actually happening on this application? Are these two things able to communicate? Like, is there latency between them? Like, what's actually going to give me as much information about the network, that piece I can't really see between those applications as you can? And and they find that it's very difficult to do in a Kubernetes environment in general with a lot of the other uh, CNIs that we see out there. So with Cilium, when you install Cilium and then you do Cilium Hubble enable, and then you like leverage Hubble to actually just see what's happening. And maybe you turn on a parser, like you turn on an HTTP parser or you turn on the DNS parser and you're able to see those DNS queries and what the responses were and like whether right. it's a text domain, it's like that level of visibility mm -hmm. is like still our almost, is, is still the use case that just completely blows people out of the water every single time. That's amazing. And, yeah. <laughs> and in the service mesh, um, we did a survey and we were asking yeah. people what features they were most interested in, what was a must have. Observability was number one by some distance. Oh, yeah. And yeah. The, the, and it's very interesting how much of that we just already had through Hubble. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. What, 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 I guess, you know, the. EBPF, does it have any kind of equivalent in history, right? Like, it doesn't really. This is like a game changer, in my opinion. There hasn't been this level of ease of getting to this context. As yeah, for sure. I, I, don't think there is a, yeah. I, I don't think there's a historical equivalent because it's so broad. You know, you can right. hook EBPF yeah. programs in literally anywhere into the kernel. I think this is one of the things that isn't necessarily 
super well understood about eBPF yet and mm -hmm. um, something I'm going to be talking about at SecurityCon because we've seen projects using eBPF to intercept system calls, which is, you know, really useful and yeah. a good way of instrumenting what uh, an application is trying to do. But it has limitations. And that's just like the surface layer. We can hook eBPF programs into anywhere, you know, thousands and thousands of places. <laughs> and really yeah. the art of eBPF is knowing where to hook and what information you're going to get in those different, um, in those different points. So, um, uh, yeah, being able to, for example, hook into the right places to spot um, let's say file access mm. without being vulnerable to um, time of check to time of use vulnerabilities that mm. are that have been well known in kind of the community for you know it, it is well known that things like uh, you know setcom or mm. um, uh, ptrace you know if you're hooking in at the syscall entry level you there is time for a, a, a user space thread to modify. Uh, a parameter before the kernel has actually copied that parameter wow. and but if you hook into the the right part of the kernel after that parameter has been copied into kernel memory mm -hmm. you're not vulnerable so um that's wow. that's something i'm going to be talking about on that's, tuesday <laughs> that's intense yeah no there are a lot of well there's two day zeros at KubeCon this year, so it's a little confusing. Day zero, day zero, zero is what I'm calling it. Uh, <laughs> when is minus one? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, it feels weird, the minus one yeah. thing. Like, it should Actually, be I mean, one. like, ele elevators in, in, in Europe, that's how they do it, right? If there's, like, a floor below the ground level, it's, like, zero, and then minus one, minus zero. Yeah, is, oh, really? is that yeah. not a global thing? Oh, no. <laughs> I've never seen that. Usually it's like L, 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 or yeah, like yeah. something else, yeah. like lower level, that kind of thing. Oh, that's true. You quite often have like G or something for. Yep. Some garage. places have like ground level and yeah, it's, yeah. L so I was going to say, um, yeah, go ahead. I was going to add a little bit of context around like, you know, have we done this before thing? And I think that like one of the things that like, um, one of the things I wanted to point out was that we have. In the past, we've done a, quite a bit of work to kind of change the entry point of things, right? So when we're thinking about service mesh, for example, we're thinking about can we insert something that will insert itself sort of into the application layer so we can get better visibility of what's happening from that application without having to instrument the application, right? And that was kind of a step forward from the way that we think about, you know, how do we instrument applications? How can we monitor these things? And and that's been kind of the direction that, um, and, and we've done that over and over again, right? Like. Um, I think with Cilium as a CNI, and what we're and what we're trying to accomplish here with eBPF, we're basically moving quite a lot of the functions that have traditionally been lower level things, mm -hmm. like for example, the entry point into the network, the ability to define things like you know, like at what point do you enforce things like network policy, right? Mm -hmm. Traditionally, we've enforced network policy, you know, after the packet has left. The, the the net you know is at yeah. some point on it's, the network it's already in here yeah exactly <laughs> but with ebpf we can enforce that network policy at the socket layer we can determine before this is a packet whether it should be allowed egress that's impressive right like and if you think about that like one of the other ones that really kind of blew my mind i was listening to um a good friend John Fastman here at Isovalent, who is one of the one of the kernel hackers on the Linux kernel on, in the eBPF space, mm -hmm. and he was and he was pointing out like another paradigm that we've broken that I just you know is still kind of wrapping my head around as a networking guy. Um, he says, you know, when we evaluate networking equipment, whether they be a firewall or a router or a switch, we think about this. We we measure its performance in packets per second. Mm -hmm. PPS, yeah, totally. So. How many of those packets are needed? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can affect this before it's a packet. Yeah, like, <laughs> like that's amazing. <laughs> that is, that is truly great amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That now is the, really cool. the the capabilities I see are just like it. I can't describe them because they're just so like the energy savings story, right? Like that yeah. in and of itself is like a mind blowing thing. But the idea that you can stop something from even occurring on your network before like it hits a network device potentially 
uh, yeah. or, or sometime shortly thereafter, right? Like edge firewall into your cluster kind of thing. Um, yeah. But yeah, like, and it's not just at the boundary anymore where you apply policy. It's all the way through the stack where you can apply yep. a policy. Right? right up at the application layer, right? Yeah. You can write policy that allows for an application, just like in, you know, in one of the other uh, policy use cases for service mesh are the idea that you could write a, a rule that says this application can connect to this API serviced by this other application, mm -hmm. but only at these specific paths, right? right. That's a, like a layer seven policy rule. Yeah, that's like right. next to impossible to enforce on a real, like on an existing thing. Yeah. yeah. And we can do that with Cilium Network Policy without sidecars. And we've been doing that, right? That's been layer seven policy has been around for quite some time. Because awesome. again, we can, our entry point is the application layer, right? Like we can, we're able to like parse everything about what's happening at that traffic right at the kernel layer and then determine whether to allow or deny that traffic right there. And I think another interesting thing that um, comes out of Cilium's network kind of you know, being present at the network layer, but also having this knowledge of Kubernetes mm -hmm. is multi-cluster support. Yeah. yeah. So the cluster mesh support in Cilium is so kind of natural in the sense that you declare a service in one cluster, you just declare a service in the same service in another cluster, you say they're global services, if the cluster, you just connect the clusters together and they are magically part of the same service nice. and i think that's really interesting for things like eks anywhere you know if you've got a an on-prem cluster and a, a you know cloud provider cluster mm -hmm. and you can share services across them in this very you know it's almost too easy kind of a way <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. no weird port opening no weird firewall rules it's just... well i mean there's a little bit of firewall in the oh, sense that well, yeah. you, know, you have to be up the clusters have to be able to yeah they have to talk other. to each other yeah, yeah, yeah and that's for me that's typically been the most difficult bit to set up and then mm -hmm. once your clusters can can actually access you know they can yeah. connect to each other getting the services um you know acting Normal, in concert yeah, across yeah. across those services it is kind of trivially easy that's just yeah. i mean that's a hard problem to solve you know having yeah. these these workloads span between you know cloud and you know on-prem data centers or you know com cloud yeah. and a building somewhere kind of thing right like that's been the hardest part of multi-cluster is getting those services to kind of work in harmony uh data yeah. gravity also but now you can kind of pretty easily kind of spread that out across anywhere really and, yeah and, and i think it's because because of this because of Cilium's presence at the kind of kubernetes identity layer you know so we can mm -hmm. you know know that okay this is a service and it's marked as global so i should tell all my other cluster friends about it and uh, this is how we do it. it's with uh, we have like an etcd uh sort of shared data of like what are global services on each mm -hmm. cluster and uh, and then at the network layer, they're just they're just endpoints. You know, they're they're mm -hmm. all just endpoints from Cilium's point of view. And you can set things like affinity, right? So, like in EKS, yeah. anywhere the model is that you can actually build task based clusters, right? Your idea, yeah. you're leveraging cluster API, is that you could spin up a cluster for maybe in different regions, maybe for different purposes, maybe for mm -hmm. different like you know a variety of different you know a variety of different decision points about why you might create a cluster. And with uh, and with cluster mesh, you know, basically you could determine like I will I, I will host the vault instance in this cluster, where I can actually keep track of like what's exactly accessing vault regardless of the consumer, and then I will share that vault instance with all of the other application clusters so that they can go to vault and get the keys that they need to be able to, you know, securely grab credentials and those sorts of things, right? You know, and that way. I don't have to disperse this everywhere. I could actually, right. I could centralize that service. We should, we should talk like after our day zero events, cause I'm doing GitOps con and secrets management is like the hardest part of GitOps right now. And oh, yeah. we're trying to find like ways around this problem. And a lot of it is like layering different tooling on top of each other, which I don't necessarily like, but just because it increases complexity, but maybe there's something GitOps can do with eBPF to make that secret distribution easier. And we do have some use cases where we've actually leveraged eBPF to effectively, um, you know how you can actually do it like a transparent proxy thing where you, you're using a corporate CA mm -hmm. to sign 
for all certificates that you're going to issue to. And so you can actually write policy that says, you know, like this application could reach these FQDNs and you right. want to assure that that's the case because you want to be able to effectively, you know, uh, 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 you want to inspect the server name and make mm -hmm. sure that like the thing you're connecting to is actually what it is based at the TLS layer. So we do have a couple of different use cases that with, with Cilium that can be leveraged in EKS anywhere and everywhere else to, to really kind of prove that out. And that would give you the ability to like really ensure that even if somebody writes a, if somebody writes a policy that says, you know, this application can actually reach these pieces and they're all TLS encrypted that we're able to use that server name to validate that that's actually correct. Amazing. All right. Well, we're out of time here, but I know you, you all will be at a uh, cube County U in Valencia and you have two booths, the Cilium booth and then the isovalent booth. Anything else you want to mention before we drop off here? If you see somebody like this wearing a hat like this, come say hello. I have stickers. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm coming for your stickers. <laughs> we should have books. We should have some uh, some books to give away. Um, oh. I've well, the, the, those little O'Reilly reports. I've just done one about what oh. EDPF is, and uh, nice, our nice. colleague Natalia and Jed Salazar has done one about security observability. So uh, yeah, hopefully those will have arrived in Valencia when you know before us, and uh, we'll be able to give them away, which would be exciting. Awesome. Thank you very much. That I, like I can't wait. Like this has been a great session, folks. Check out EVPF. Check out Cilium. See what it can do for you. Think about it in the context of on-prem and cloud, you know, blending the two together. And yep. uh, thank you both so much for coming on and spending the half hour with me. I appreciate it. Thanks for See having us, Chris. <laughs> Have a good day, everybody. Take it easy. Hey, welcome back to Containers from the Couch. Hey, wait a minute, Justin. I'm a co-host of the show, and I don't have one of those pillows. What's up oh, with that? I'm sorry. I thought you did. Here. Oh, thank you so much. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, anything I can do. Hey, there's likely new content since you've been gone, so check it out below. And if you haven't subscribed, please hit that subscribe button, and also hit the notifications button to get notified when we go live so you can join us live in chat and ask your questions in real time. And let us know what other content you want to see in the future. Hey everyone, Cy Venom here with AWS. Now, here at AWS, we're committed to giving customers choice, especially when it comes to running containers at scale. Now, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback about the experiences that we've built on AWS Cloud, but customers want to leverage the power of AWS when running in on-premises environments. Now, today we're going to be focusing on EKS, Elastic Kubernetes Service, and two ways that customers can leverage EKS to run containers on-premises. It's also going to be EKS running on an AWS outpost, as well as EKS anywhere. Let's get started with the foundation of an outpost. So an outpost is going to be AWS supplied and managed hardware. Essentially what I mean by that is that uh, AWS is going to be able to do, and, and rather is going to do, uh, the security patches and keeping the infrastructure up to date uh, when, and when running in uh, an outpost-based environment. An outpost in many ways can be considered an extension of an AWS region. Uh, in addition, this is going to be hardware that you'll need to obtain directly from AWS. Switching gears here a little bit, let's look at EKS Anywhere. And one of the critical distinct, uh, distinctions here is that it's going to be actually running on your hardware. Uh, essentially, uh, this means that for customers that have already invested in some hardware, this can be a key decision point if they want to be able to continue to use that hardware for running EKS uh, or running containers in an on-premises environment. Now today, if you want to run production workloads on EKS Anywhere, we support VMware vSphere, which is a virtualization platform. Uh, but very soon, we're looking to also support bare metal as well as the Snow family of AWS devices. Now for non-production workloads, you can basically run EKS anywhere, anywhere. And that includes on your local machine. Uh, there's a great way to kind of get started very quickly with EKS anywhere. Uh, let's kind of shift gears again and talk a little bit about outposts. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about is the connectivity modes that both of these support, because I think that really frames the discussion for how they're different. So with an outpost, you really need fixed connectivity. Uh, and, and essentially, we talked about this a little bit already with it being an extension of an AWS region. 
AWS needs to be able to communicate with the infrastructure to do things like those security patches. Uh, but critically, the, it also uh, affects the EKS architecture as well. Uh, and in addition, in an outpost, you can deploy more than just EKS. You can deploy things like S3, EBS, RDS, uh, and, and a number of other services you can launch directly in uh, the, the outpost itself. But let's bring this back to EKS for a minute and go through an example. Let's say as an operator, I want to actually manage uh, a cluster. I want to administer, operate an EKS cluster. So let's see what that looks like. So the first thing as an operator, uh, when running EKS on an outpost, you would use the same standard set of APIs that you would be if you were running EKS on uh, AWS Cloud. Uh, and so those same standard set of APIs are going to be exposed to the operator. And this is what's uh, essentially going to enable them to communicate with the control plane. And here we've got the control plane. It's going to be running on EC2. And this is going to let us communicate to the data plane. So let's see how that works. So through that fixed connectivity model, this connectivity, uh, this control plane will talk to uh, the worker nodes that are running in the outpost itself. So the workers are here, and this essentially is the EKS component running on the outpost. So you can kind of see uh, that's this extended cluster architecture with the control plane managed by AWS. Uh, you're responsible for the worker nodes running on your on-premises hardware, and you have that fixed connectivity that's essentially required. Now let's switch gears here a little bit and look at EKS Anywhere. Now, the connectivity modes that are supported here are going to be a little bit more flexible. So here, you can have you know, a permanent connect, uh, connection. You can have uh, a disconnected mode here. And you can even do partial connectivity. So to really explain why uh, this is possible with EKS Anywhere, I think we need to take a step back and talk about what exactly EKS Anywhere is. Uh, EKS Anywhere is an open source capability. And so uh, one of the first things uh, I want to talk about that's part of this open source capability is EKS Distro. EKS Distro is a distribution of Kubernetes, and it's the same one that we use on AWS. And it's open source, by the way. Uh, so EKS Anywhere comes with EKS Distro plus a number of opinionated uh, packages, you know, open source capabilities to help you manage your on-premises environment. So let's take a look at some of those. So let's say that, for example, obviously you're going to need a CLI to work with it. But in addition, maybe something like Flux. So this is something we support for uh, automating some of the operation tasks with an on-premises EKS cluster, things like editing the number of worker nodes. So let's go back to our example here. Let's say that as an operator, you know, I'm working against I'm using these tools, and this is going to let me uh, administer my cluster. So, you know, using the CLI or some of the automation capabilities, uh, I kind of reach into my cluster here, and you'll notice one of the key differences here. We're going to have the control plane running on premises, which in turn will talk to the worker nodes, which are also on premises. So this is kind of why we can have this flexible connectivity. Uh, essentially here, you can even do an air gap deployment where you don't necessarily ever need to communicate back to AWS. And so why would we even have these multiple connectivity modes, you might ask? Uh, for example, this fully connected or partially connected? Well, uh, customers want a way to leverage the power of AWS when running in these environments. Uh, and so we created something called the EKS connector. This is essentially going to enable uh, customers to leverage, uh, essentially, EKS and some of the standard APIs we have available here uh, to, to do a number of things. So let's kind of see how that works, right? So uh, you know, data from the worker nodes here would kind of go through the connectivity modes available uh, and, and basically talk to EKS running in the cloud. Now, uh, that operator, they can use the same standard set of APIs, kind of that we talked about before with EKS on an outpost, uh, to communicate 
to EKS. So what's the point of this? Well, today you can use this to get a single pane of glass view. That's right, you can see your EKS clusters uh, running, you know, EKS Anywhere clusters running alongside your EKS clusters uh, on AWS in the console. So for now, it's that visibility that you get. Uh, one thing I want to be clear about, we're not necessarily streaming any application data itself. The workloads kind of run uh, contained in this environment. We're really streaming just the metadata about the objects, the deployments, the Kubernetes constructs, and that enables us to get that visibility. Uh, in the future, we're actually looking to add more interesting support here, things like support for app mesh, or maybe you want to route all of your logs coming from your applications into a central place running on AWS. Uh, I'm really excited for the future of EKS Connector and kind of what it enables for EKS Anywhere deployments. Next, I want to talk a little bit about support. Now, we've said this before and I'll say it again, uh, an AWS outpost is like an extension of an AWS region. And so that same support you get with uh, EKS running in the cloud, you're, you're essentially covered. You have support when running EKS on an outpost. Now with EKS Anywhere, it's an open source capability. So you'll need to get support through a subscription. But there's something really interesting here. So we'll support not just the EKS distro, the Kubernetes distribution itself, but we'll also support the opinionated flows with some of the, the capabilities that we bundle with it. And that includes the, the GitOps-based approach with Flux, uh, the CNI, the Container Network Interface, which is Cilium, uh, as well as operating systems like Bottle Rocket, as well as Ubuntu. Uh, so with that support uh, mechanism through that subscription, you, you're kind of opinionated, those open source capabilities are supported as well. This can be really criti critical for customers looking for support when running uh, containers and Kubernetes in an on-premises environment. Now, you might have noticed a theme here that's kind of emerging, and that's one of simplicity versus flexibility. Now, with EKS running on an outpost, you get simplicity. It's managed hardware, it's managed infrastructure at the end of the day, the control plane is managed, but you have a fixed connectivity mode. Uh, it's kind of one of those caveats and you're working with AWS managed supplied hardware. Now on the other hand here with EKS Anywhere, you get flexibility. Uh, you get flexibility at the cost of additional operational overhead. But the thing is you can plug and play with open source capabilities. You can administer both the control plane and the worker nodes. It's your hardware and you have flexible connectivity modes, which can be really critical for air gap deployments, uh, such as in some edge environments where connectivity might be kind of rough. Uh, and, and so you're, you're, you're giving up some of that uh, simplicity uh, for flexibility. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's really a trade-off between the two. Uh, I really hope today's video helped you understand a little bit better between the differences uh, with EKS anywhere versus EKS running on an AWS outpost. Uh, and hopefully helps you make the right decision for your business. Uh, if you've enjoyed this video, be sure to stay tuned for more videos like this in the future. Thank you. That was awesome, Sai. I always love your Lightboard videos, man. Like, no matter what you're talking about, they're just fascinating. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, honestly, I just wanted to thank uh, you for hosting today, as well as all of the, the guest speakers that we had. I think we had some really awesome sessions today. Uh, team, it was all about EKS Anywhere. Of course, today it's hosted by containers from the couch. I dropped a link in the chat. If you want to catch more content from us, we're regularly updating. I'm sure you guys remember our host from the last two days, Justin Garrison. Uh, he's going to be on making shorts, making YouTube content. Uh, I'll be uploading more Lightboard videos as well. And Chris, we're trying to get you on there too. Like, I think this has sparked like something in me. Just hosting these two sessions today for an hour, right? Like. Yeah, let's do some of this live streaming stuff. Yeah, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. The energy is is awesome. And, and yeah, after I get back from KubeCon, I'm trying to do a bunch of GitOps shorts, to be honest with you. Uh, I've got yeah. the gear and the everything's here, so there's no excuse anymore. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should uh, do a GitOps Lightboard video, too. I, I had a <laughs> lot of people asking me for that one, so it would be it would be a great one to do. That would be dope. I'll, I'll have to consult you as uh, our, our resident I mean, GitOps expert. <laughs> I would almost say, like, Fly down to Austin, like you know, why not? Let's, Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that'd be fun. I would love to. That'd be great. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Really, this has been a fantastic past three days, four days, I think now. Um, really exciting stuff coming up. 
in the pipeline, right? And and with QCon next week, there's going to be more announcements and more news that you could ever shake a stick at. So I'm going to plug something for myself for once. Uh, EKS News is actually a newsletter I put together every week, and I would love it if you subscribe. Uh, I have the help of Cy and the other DAs, of course, obviously, but, uh, you know, like next week there won't be one because I'll be out of the country and that's hard to coordinate. But, uh, <laughs> you know, whenever there's an announcement or news or anything like that, it's in EKS News. We also try to include some ecosystem goings-ons to keep you informed in that area as well. So feel free to subscribe and uh, get the latest and greatest in your inbox once a week. Absolutely. If there's one thing you follow, if you want to keep up with all things Kubernetes, especially at AWS, I'd say hit hit a follow button. Hit the follow button on the EKS News newsletter because it's, it's that one-stop shop. All of our latest updates, feature updates, new content from myself and the other hosts on Container mm -hmm. from the Couch. Uh, you'll, you'll always be in the know uh, with EKS News. Yep. Uh, and so with that, team, thank you so much for joining us. We've got KubeCon EU next week in person. Chris and I will both be there. Come if by the booth. Second, yeah, come by the booth, say hi. And even if you're joining virtually, be sure to reach out and say hi. Uh, we're always excited to, to talk to customers, users, and just developers in general. So uh, definitely come and say hi. Awesome. Thank you, Sai. Thanks for everything you've done today. Thanks for this whole week of everything. Justin, I know you're out there somewhere over the Atlantic. Thank you uh, for having this wonderful platform for us to use. All right. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone.